Um, well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I guess everyone is on a Mediterranean time here. <laughs> but those of you who are here, we'll just get started. Um, now, the title for this talk is uh, something that has been uh, one of the things that I've uh, seen from my 30 plus years of being in the field. It kind of summarizes the essence of what I think transpersonal psychology has meant uh, to me personally, but also to the larger cultural global context. And uh, <coughs> I'm sure you can all, first of all, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Sounds good? Okay. Is that clear enough? Can we get some lights off in the front? Because I think that would yeah. that would help, yeah. Pardon? That would help, yeah. The guy's gone. So. Okay. So let me go ahead and just uh, read this uh, title, uh, just because it is the theme of my talk. Spiritual emergencies. And how many of you have heard that term before? Good. It is one of the parts of the themes of transpersonal psychology, one of its contributions, and spiritual practices. How transpersonal psychology liberated Western civilization and psychotherapy from its reliance on Greco, Judeo, Christian myths and practices. So, um, I think just the both title, I'm trying to cover that, and that theme of the title are both, in a way, acts of hubris. And this is a picture of Icarus flying too close to the sun. So is there anybody working on getting the lights turned down? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. Um, and um, where we are here, right now, this is Crete, and um, it, Crete historically has been at the crossroads of uh, the Middle East, even extending to Asia. Of course, we have the Silk Road that would take things from Asia into the Middle East. Uh, we've got Africa over here. Uh, we've got, of course, Greece here and the rest of Europe. And here is Crete sitting in the middle of all of this on these navigation roads, on the Silk Road. And in a way, it was a precursor of what we have now in our uh, civilization, in our uh, planet, which is a true. A, a, global communication and sharing and uh, um, contact. So what we now can easily do on our iPhones or on our computers, find out about, you know, what is this Tibetan Buddhist stuff? Type in Tibetan Buddhism, and you've got the sacred texts from, you know, monasteries at 20,000 feet or 15,000 feet. Uh, you've got uh, books available, you've got articles, all of that. And, uh, thank you. And, and Crete was really the center of the world for a period of time. So uh, now we're a little uh, in a different era where everybody is, uh, has that at their fingertips. So this presentation will focus on the impact that transpersonal psychology has had in that process of disseminating the treasures and fruits of uh, the cultures and civilizations from around the world uh, together. Um, and that's really been the role of transpersonal psychology from the get-go. One of the reasons transpersonal psychology was founded by Abraham Maslow 
uh, in the United States was because of a sense that here we were having this influx of things from Asia, practices, yoga, the uh, Qigong, uh, meditation, and psychology was ignoring it. And he felt that a true psychology needed to uh, incorporate things that were uh, the uh, practices from other cultures that were addressing some of the same issues that we address in psychology. Um, now, when psychology first became an academic uh, discipline, uh, it uh, began immediately by uh, appropriating the Greco-Judeo-Christian myths and practices. And, of course, myth is embodied in our name. There's Psyche, uh, who uh, journeyed into the underworld and kind of became the symbol, or came to personify the soul. And so that's in our field. And uh, Pan is in our term Pan. And it comes from this. Pan is associated with making loud noises, hence the term panic. <coughs> And Ananki is a goddess of kind of foreboding, of anxiety. She literally, if you had contact with her, you became nervous. So that's where we get our term anxiety. And the main ads, Dionysian worshippers, are still dancing, at least etymologically, in our term mania. Um, so, uh, what is called in biology the survival value. And Joseph Campbell compared it to the instincts of birds building nests. An exactly comparable biological function is served in our own species by a mythology, which is no less indispensable biological organ, no less a product of nature. Like the nest of a bird, a mythology is fashioned in materials drawn from the local environment according to an architecture unconsciously di dictated from within. Or as Houston Smith said, myth orchestrates the culture and consciousness of entire civilizations. It carries the coatings of existence. And Eliara made the point that it really, myth mythology is kind of a bridge between our local consciousness and the transcendent realms and forms. And the way he said that is, the personal unconscious and private mythologies alone cannot awaken an individual's mystical consciousness. It requires the general and the universal symbols to awaken individual experience and transmute it into a spiritual act, into metaphysical comprehension of the world. And as Joseph Campbell said, mythological symbols touch and exhilarate centers of life beyond the reach of vocabularies of reason and coercion. So uh, myths awaken and maintain in the individual a sense of awe and gratitude in relation to the universe. And they really facilitate that process in us um, through their symbolic nature. Now, myths have a shadow side. Throughout history, myths also create an otherness. So in the Bible, which is a religious mythology of our culture, uh, we see an example of this ethnocentric mentality. In the Bible, it says, there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Uh, and, the, and of course, if that's what you believe, then that can justify a lot of behaviors. This is a picture of the, uh, what happened in Jericho, which was a, a genocidal fury. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very important point for us to acknowledge that Sam Keen and Joseph Campbell made. One of the most neglected aspects of mythology is that myths always tell us 
who we may kill and who and how we may kill them without guilt. Mythology tells you who you may project the shadow onto. <coughs> so I think that's an important dimension of this. Uh, and uh, it certainly isn't limited to the Bible. It uh, was part of Alexander's ravaging of temples on his path through India, the Crusaders, mass murdering of non-believers, and the wake of destruction committed in the name of Allah during Islam's expansion into Africa and Europe, all justified by their mythologies. Um, and another, well, that, I just want to acknowledge that shadow side, but myths have been spreading around the world through this contact that I was pointing out with, that happened starting really in Crete. And in, often, uh, it's a, even though a lot of it has been spread by conquering, it can very well be that the conquering people pick up the mythologies of the people they have conquered more than the other way around. Um, and in this modern era of disintegration, there is a new willingness on the part of people all over the world to search beyond the cultural boundaries and barriers for integrated solutions to ecological, economic, and spiritual crises. And now we can see that we are all passengers on Spaceship Earth, as Buckminster Fuller uh, described us. And uh, so now the old in-group and out-group components of the most ancient and traditional myths are dated, are out of date. By, the, uh, by their limited horizons extending to a narrowly defined group. Now, um, even some of the most, I think, uh, enlightened people in the world of articulating myth still have their biases and their blinders. So, for example, James Hillman stated, I am Orthodox, holding for the old, the traditional, the ones of our own culture. Again, Ben, if you're on a spaceship Earth, what is our culture versus somebody else's culture? Um, so, the ones of, uh, that are Greek, Roman, Celtic, and Nordic myths, the Bible, legends, and folk tales, the main body of biblical and classical tales directs fantasy into organized, deeply life-giving psychological patterns. <coughs> Jung also had a similar bias. And this is one of his uh, concerns about the spread of yoga. You cannot be a good Christian, either in your faith or in your morality, or in your intellectual makeup and practice, and, and also practice genuine yoga at the same time. The trouble is that Western man cannot get rid of his history as easily as his short-legged memory can. History, one might say, is written in the blood. I would not advise anyone to touch <laughs> yoga. <laughs> um, and yet, certainly, Hillman has contributed immensely to our understanding of myth. And uh, in particular, the Jungians have really articulated uh, and expanded our knowledge about Greek myths. So we have Jane Bol Jean Bolin's book, Gods in Every Man and Goddesses in Every Woman. But maybe you can see where I am going, which is that uh, transpersonal psychology was the one who said, wait a minute, if Greek myths are good, why not look at African myths and Asian myths? I mean, why limit ourselves? Uh, if, as Jerome Bruner said, Bruner said, myths provide a library of scripts against which the individual may judge the internal drama of his or her multiple realities, why limit ourselves to the Greek myths? And I think this is where transpersonal psychology, uh, as I pointed out in the title, liberated us. I mean, as much as Greek, Greco, Judeo-Christian myths have a lot to share and say, uh, it really should expand our interest in the global repertoire of mythology. 
Um, so, um, uh, this is a picture that was one of Joseph Campbell's favorite pictures. And it is a picture of the uh, moon rising over the cross there with the uh, moon. It's a sunrise over the moon. An earth rise over the moon. And <laughs> just look at it. Um, so um, I think this is uh, what, what was inspiring to Joseph Campbell about it is the same thing as inspired Buckminster Fuller, which is to really see the earth as a um, unified body rather than get bogged down and limited by our cultures. Um, and we are now um, in an era which Nietzsche called the age of comparisons. We have access to the whole global repertoire of myth and religion. And Joseph Campbell, I think, uh, was a, one of the pioneers in uh, harvesting the fruits of this global repertoire of religion and, uh, and myth. And this is how he did it. I found that the way to become really familiar with these lines is by a comparative method, not remaining fixed in one mythological tradition, our own, for example, or to get excited by one other and get stuck in one mythological tradition, which until recently was the way things went, but to make a comparison back and forth ancient and medieval and modern, great civilizations of India, China, Japan, the Muslim world, the non-literate society, these are all clues to the basic human structuring function. Uh, and Jung, even despite his Western bias, uh, argued that all psychologists should receive education in mythology, and he didn't say just uh, European <coughs> mythology, to provide them with a comparative anatomy of the psyche. So in medical school, you spend a lot of time learning the anatomy of the body, and we as psychologists should spend a lot of time learning the anatomy of the psyche, as represented in this. And again, uh, this is how we can, uh, by educating ourselves about the whole global uh, library of myths, that's, that's the way to uh, learn that. Okay, now uh, I want to quote, uh, this is a picture of uh, Mary Fukuyama, a woman who I've had the opportunity to work with a little bit, uh, and she is one of the pioneers in the United States in the area of multicultural uh, psychology. Um, and uh, this is a book of hers, Integrating Spirituality into Multicultural Counseling. And she was getting very interested in transpersonal psychology at the same time that I was getting very interested in multicultural uh, psychology. And we ended up collaborating on a couple of things. But there, this is a quote of hers. There is no doubt the multicultural and the spiritual perspective. So again, it's going across our cultural boundaries. Okay. So I want to talk specifically about the contributions of transpersonal psychology to the world of psychotherapy. And one of the main uh, contributions was the concept of spiritual emergency, a concept that was coined by Stan and Christina Groff as a Crisis relates to sudden spiritual emergence during which the process of growth and change becomes chaotic and overwhelming. In such episodes, individuals often suddenly and dramatically enter into new realms of mystical and spiritual experience. However, they may also become fearful and confused and have difficulty coping with their daily lives, jobs, and relationships. Well, that was one of the areas that I did uh, work in in my starting at the beginning of my career. And um, um, 
I think one of the contributions that transpersonal psychology has made to the field of mental health, of psychology, has been opening up the door to being able to integrate uh, some uh, uh, awareness of the role that spirituality plays in our clients' lives. And uh, one of the ways that I worked uh, that into the mental health field is through this category in the DSM. It's in the, we got it into the DSM four in 1994, and it just is uh, continued in the DSM five, which was published last year. And the DSM has been called, in terms of mythology, the Bible of mental health. Not here, not in Europe, but in the United States. Uh, and this is a category in there that basically means that it is okay to talk to clients about religion and spirituality because people can have problems with that area. They can have conflicts. They may want to talk to a therapist about their religious and spiritual uh, conflicts, experiences, and so on. So by having it anchored in the DSM, it opened up the door to being able to talk about religion and spirituality in mental health. Uh, and I attribute that to those of us in the transpersonal field making this point. Not me alone, but I was one of the three people who proposed this. And another is the introduction of <coughs> spiritual practices, mindfulness practices in particular. Now, Herbert Benson started to do research on meditation in the late 1960s, but it was on, he looked at the benefits of meditation for uh, uh, high blood pressure. Um, it wasn't until, uh, the early, I think 1971, that Ram Dass had an article in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. Uh, that's the type, that's the, Title of it. In those days, he called himself Baba Ram Das, and he gave a lecture at the Menninger Foundation, which is a major psychiatric institute in the United States. Uh, and um, some of you may know this is a picture of him. He was a professor at Harvard who kind of dropped out of Harvard, got, you know, as part of his getting involved in psychedelics, and then he also went to India, and this is him with his. This is him with his guru. And, um, and he was one of the people who um, brought, started you know, uh, bringing back some of the wisdom, some of the practices, some of the insights uh, from uh, Asia to the United States. And uh, I, 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 I saw him at, uh, I, I first got introduced to him through some transpersonal psychology conferences. Okay, and another w way that uh, transpersonal psychology has contributed to the mental health field is through its sensitivity to non-ordinary states of consciousness. Uh, and many schools of psychology, and I'll quote uh, uh, transpersonal psychologist here, many states of Many schools of psychology adhere to an unnecessarily restricted view of the psyche and refuse to work therapeutically with spiritual experience and experiences of non-ordinary reality. But here in transpersonal psychology, uh, we have, of course, holotropic breathwork. This is a picture uh, from the uh, ITA Eurotas conference in Moscow, which had I think it was around. <laughs> not, not I think it's Prague. Pardon? Prague. Oh, this France. is Prague. This is 1992. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> you can see quite a few people there. The one in Moscow had over 500 people, wasn't it? Uh, 445. 445 people. In Prague, 430. Uh, 330. Okay. So, but that's certainly been one of the contributions of transpersonal psychology is to open up. Things like breath work, meditation, body work, movement, dream 
where God, well, dream work I would give you a musical form. Guided imagery, prayer, drumming, chanting, sweat lodges, fasting, shamanic journeying, and psychedelic drugs uh, to bring them into the conversation about uh, mental health. And one of the people leading that is this man, whom I met, in this, this is Rick Doblin, he's the founder of MAPS. How many of you have heard of this organization called MAPS? Okay, about half of you. MAPS stands for Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. And it was founded by Rick Doblin. Rick Doblin, I met him at initially at transpersonal psychology conferences where he would organize panels on uh, using MDMA or, or in psychotherapy or something like that. And at a certain point in doing that, he did that from the 1970s into the uh, in 1980s, he realized that he was well in English you would say preaching to the choir. <laughs> that he was talking to people who already accepted what he was saying, and he sharpened our perspectives and understanding, but he was totally missing having any impact on the larger culture. He then decided he needed to get a doctorate. He went to Harvard, got a doctorate in uh, governmental studies with a specialization in drug policy, and then was able to go to Washington, D.C. in the United States, and took many years, convinced the government to start to allow research on psychedelic drugs again. And now he has raised 10, uh, uh, ten last I heard it was around $10 million to fund research on using MDMA, using LSD, using psilocybin, and, and so on, to treat very difficult conditions like PTSD. And uh, I, I think transpersonal psychology should also be given uh, some credit for uh, providing an opportunity for people like Rick Doblin to keep that uh, area alive for a while and then to move it ahead. Okay. Um, and the other area, I'll, before I show this slide, uh, is in the treatment of psychosis. I think transpersonal psychology <coughs> has been uh, keeping alive the idea that, trans uh, that psychosis can be positively transformative, and that's an area that I've also done work on, helping people who have had schizophrenia or bipolar manic depression uh, uh, recover their uh, altered state experiences that they have in psychosis and in mania as valid experiences that can actually contribute to their recovery. And that's not been the usual perspective in the mental health field, but again, transpersonal psychology has uh, kept that perspective alive, and I've given workshops even in many public mental health settings on that issue. So the final point I want to make about this is that this is now a two-way street. This isn't, you know, uh, trans, you know, uh, Western transpersonal psychology absorbing things from Asia, there has been a feedback loop that has been created. Um, so Haru Makaru uh, is a uh, Japanese psychologist who came to the United States and studied for about 10 years at CIS, got his PhD. He is now back in Japan. He's a professor of psychology and is president of the Japanese Transpersonal Association. And, um, one of the things that he's connected with is the Zen movement in Japan, which is actually struggling. You could almost say it's dying. Um, my wife and I were in Kyoto and visited one of the Japanese Zen <coughs> temple complexes. And out of the 26 buildings, three were kept open. The rest were sitting empty. And, uh, trans and Zen is a monastic tradition in Japan. 
and there aren't that many people wanting to become Zen monks. Now, Haru knew from his experience in the United States about the Zen hospice. How many of you have heard of Zen hospice? Okay, it's in San Francisco, and they are a pioneering best practices organization for working with people who are dying. Interestingly, there is no tradition in Zen of working with people who are dying. That is something that Frank Ostaseski in the United States brought together, hospice and Zen. Then, Haru invited my wife, Crystal, who's giving a workshop on this later uh, today, uh, and works at a hospice, invited us to Japan to teach about these kinds of issues, about working spiritually with the spiritual issues of people who are dying. And as I say, this did not happen in Japan, but here we are at a Japanese Zen temple in Tokyo giving a workshop on this. So this is, you know, the Zen work came from Japan to the United States. It got integrated into the hospice work and exported back to Japan. And, whoops. And uh, a similar thing has been happening in India. And Stu Svatsky has been one of the architects of this and has written about this and organized a conference in India in 2005, I think. Okay. They had our, in 2008. Sorry, it's right up there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was also a very pioneering event because Indian psychology, like most psychologies, has become very Western oriented. And here were a group of, psych you know, this was sponsored by ATP, a group of Western psychologists coming to India, sharing the Western psychology, but also really validating the uh, uh, practices from India that many uh, their own psychologists thought of as primitive. And it was actually quite controversial to do a fire ceremony at this conference. There were actually some psychologists who would not participate in the conference because ATP was, had organized a fire ceremony. But Stu Svatsky has also documented that, that this is now having a two-way um, street where uh, uh, the yoga of the West uh, that where these charismatic indigenous yogas of India uh, and the interest that, that they are having in the West is validating these practices back in India as well. Okay, and then another example of that is uh, uh, the work that I got to do in Kyrgyzstan. And a group in Kyrgyzstan of, um, uh, it was a, some psychiatrists, anthropologists, and uh, direct, director of a counseling center, and so on, got together on their own to try to figure out how to preserve their indigenous spirituality that was declining because of the influence of uh, Islam coming in and also westernization. And they ended up concluding that transpersonal psychology was the psychology that would best fit their uh, 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 culture because it would appreciate their indigenous spirituality as well as um, uh, bringing uh, practices that could be useful. Um, and so this is a picture at the, uh, they organized a seminar, brought me over for a week to teach about transpersonal psychology and in the seminar, there were also a number of their own indigenous healers. So this is one of their healers. Uh, he has a whip in this hand, and he is taking this whip, bringing it up, and then coming, you know, like, right by my side um, to dislodge some evil spirits that have uh, grabbed onto me. <laughs> okay, so David Edwards has also, uh, he's, um, uh, psychologist in uh, South Africa, and he has pointed out that transpersonal psychology has a number of features that make it particularly relevant to the South African context. 
It is a multi-state discipline which recognizes the importance of a variety of states of consciousness. This position has made meaningful contact between African traditional healers possible. Transpersonal psychology with a perspective which is much less Eurocentric than many other approaches in psychology provides a basis of theory and practice which allows for genuine dialogue with African traditional healers. Okay. So that's um, how transpersonal psychology saved Western civilization and the entire planet at this point. <laughs> so little active hoovers saved. So before I finish, I, I want us to um, uh, take, a, we're, we're going on a journey this, in this conference. But one of the journeys that I'd like us to take is uh, uh, to take uh, to go and journey across the River Styx. And as you know, that's uh, the, the river that separates the land of the living from the land of the dead. And what I want to do now is uh, recognize. Uh, some people. Um, this is a picture of Christina Groff, who died just in the last couple of months. And I'm going to use some of Ingo's uh, uh, testimonial to her as uh, describing her as one of the great ladies of transpersonal psychology and Western spirituality. And she talked openly about spiritual crises uh, out of her own experience. And she is one of the, uh, Stan actually says she's the one who developed this concept of spiritual emergence and emergency. And uh, she and Stan then founded the Spiritual Emergence Network. She co-authored many books together with Stan, among them The Stormy Search for Self. I think she may have done that one herself, actually. And her last book, uh, which came out one week before her death, uh, was called The Eggshell Landing, Love, Death, and Forgiveness in Hawaii. And that's where she was, uh, grew up and, and gave birth to her two children. And uh, she has uh, went through many of her own crises, and her relationship with Stan uh, was, for both of them, uh, an opportunity to understand what unconditional love means, and together they were both co-adventurers, soul companions, and life partners. So what I'm going to do now is to show a bunch of pictures of people who have been part of the transpersonal movement. Most of these pictures are taken from conferences, ITA, ATP, and Eurotas conferences. And I'd like to do this as a ritual. So uh, I will show a picture, and then, um, I would like, to, if one of you recognizes, now obviously you know this is Christina Groff, but I'm going to have some pictures of people that might not, uh, not everybody would recognize. I'd like one of you to call out her name, whoever recognizes this person, and then I'd like us all to repeat her, his or her name together. And I'll start with those who have crossed the river, but I also wanted to appreciate the elders in our field uh, by acknowledging them in the same way, by having us call out their name. So if you'll go ahead and we'll start with Christina. So this is Christina Groff. Christina, Christina. Christina. Oh. <coughs> Christina. Christina. Okay, Ab Abraham Mass. Angie Arian. Angie Arian, right. Arthur Hastings. Yes, let's go first with the, yeah, somebody call him out. Arthur Hastings. We'll come back just then. Albert Hoffman. Albert Hoffman. Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Marion Woodman? 
is that when the Iron Curtain fell, was it 1989, uh, he was the one who enabled people in Eastern Europe who had a deep interest in this new thing, transpersonal psychology, to start to come to the Eurotas conferences. So he started to really build Eurotas into the global organization that it is by going from Western Europe to Eastern Europe, and now we have people from all over. Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary. So, uh, we'll, maybe we can do it that way. We'll hear it, and then when I put my hand up, we can all do it. Muktananda. Muktananda. Charles Tart? Well, yeah, that, that is Charles Tart. Um, Who's the guy at Harvard who did the research on UFOs? Oh, it's John Mack. John Mack. John Mack. John Lilly. John Lilly. Yeah, now we're going to go into the room. Yeah, we have hold Christina and let's do Dalai. Conferences have had many musicians. Anybody recognize this? Hmm. Mickey Hart. Mickey Hart. Mickey Hart. Mickey Hart. Yeah. Uh, this is a Williams. African American. What? Cecil Williams. Cecil, Cecil Williams, Williams, a very important yeah. African American minister in the Bay Area. <laughs> Houston. Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake. Rupert Sheldrake. Václav Gavel. Václav Gavel. <laughs> so let's see, who do we want to focus on here? Well, we'll, we'll do them separately. Ramdas. 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 Jack Hornfield. Jack Hornfield. Well, my ritual is breaking down, but maybe we can find it. <laughs> one person say it, and let's all say it. Francis Wong. Francis Wong. Olan Tunji. Olan Tunji. Roger Wolf. Roger Walsh. <laughs> Francis Liu. And he is one of the uh, co-authors of the DSM category and also one of the pioneers of transpersonal stuff. So I've just got a few more pictures. In uh, Thomas Banyaka. A Hopi album. Thomas And the last one. Brother David Stendel Ross. David Stendel Ross. And then let's go ahead and acknowledge the other person here. As one of our elders, Stanley Rittner. Stanley Rittner. <laughs> Ralph Messner. Ralph Messner. Andrew Weil. 
Charles Grove. Charles Grove, one of the leaders of psychedelic research. And my very last picture. Let's do them both. Christina and Stan Grove. Christina and Stan Grove. Okay, thank you. Okay, yes, oh, that's right. Yes. yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention.